Okay, um, I think um, let's start on time. Hi, everyone, good morning. Um, this is April Luo from China General Chamber of Commerce USA. Thank you for joining us today um, for this webinar, Spurring for Growth, Economic Outlook, Digitalization, and API Activism. CGCC is honored to be partnering with JP Morgan on this event as part of our celebration of the Asian Pacific Islanders Heritage Month. And for those who are not familiar with CGCC, we have been recognized as the largest and most impactful nonprofit organization representing Chinese enterprises in the US. As an independent, nonpartisan, non governmental chamber of commerce, CGCC provides a broad range of programs, services, and resources to over a thousand multinational members across the US. And I'm sure everyone knows JP Morgan. So um, for more information about the two organizations, please see the message in the chat box below. And before we start, I would like to go over a few housekeeping rules. First is that today's event will be live streamed on YouTube and available on CGCC's website and social media channels after the event. So please feel free to share with your colleagues who can't make it today. And second, while today's comments are on the record, the views and opinions expressed by our guests are theirs alone and do not necessarily represent the official views or positions of JP Morgan and CGCC. And third, later on in this event, you will have the opportunity to ask our distinguished speakers questions. So please feel free to type them in the Q&A box. Our speakers will try their best to address these questions during the section. Now, I would like to hand it over to Lu Cao from JP Morgan, who is also the moderator of our today's event. Thank you, April. Um, and thank you, CGCC, for the introduction and for organizing today's event. I am Lu Cao, a member of the Global Corporate Bank at JP Morgan, responsible for our Greater China client activities in North America. It is my pleasure to introduce my fellow colleagues and panelists, Joyce Chan, Chair of Global Research, and Leah Cao, Global Head of Wholesale Payments Solutions. Thank you, Joyce and Leah, for joining us today. Um, as we look beyond the challenges and triumphs, emotions and aspirations throughout the course of this past year, a lot is at stake in the future for us as a society, as a global economy, and um, as a community. During today's discussion, we will look to share views and experiences on a number of important topics uh, that will impact the overall macro landscape, US-China economic relations, as well as diversity and inclusion. So we have a lot to cover. And let me now turn to our panelists to kick off our discussion. Um, so coming off uh, the Fed meeting yesterday, Joyce, why don't we uh, start with your thoughts on the Fed's decision to continue holding rate steady and with inflation numbers running ahead of a lot of the previous forecasts, um, how's the overall outlook uh, for the US? Uh, Joyce, you're on mute, want to unmute? Maybe the operator can unmute Joyce. Yeah, I'm, I'm here now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Lou, for, um, for and a real pleasure to April um, and the China General Chamber of Commerce for being here. So we are really entering a boom period for the global economy. Um, we have global growth, um, you know, really at the highest levels that we've seen since the 1980s. And in the U.S., in the second quarter of the year, we're looking at 10 percent growth. And for this to stay above 8 percent in the third quarter of the year. But the Fed has given us a very, very clear message that they're going to be patient um, and that they're going to take their time, even as we see inflationary pressures rising. Now, we are going to continue to see inflation run higher from here. We're actually looking at global inflation to go to 3% compared to just 1% last year. And we're seeing a number of factors contributing to this. Um, first, we are seeing that um, on the inventory that uh, there's more demand than what is in inventory right now. And particularly for a lot of the travel related sectors over the next three to five months, as the reopening um, persists, we're, we're, we're seeing some supply side um, constraints as well, and some um, constraints to the supply chain. Um, those pressures, I think, are going to stay with us um, in the second half of the year. 
longer. But the Fed has signaled um, that they are going to be very patient, that they have learned from last um, the last crises. They're not going to withdraw the stimulus um, too quickly. And we don't think that you're really going to see talk about guidance about Fed tapering until you know probably September or later in the year. And I don't think you will actually see the Fed do anything as far as raising rates until much later, you know, p- potentially going into 2023. So I think that usually when you talk about a recession, we talk about slack and output gaps, but we are now seeing that um, with the recovery that we have underway, we're likely to close the output gaps in the U.S. and China by the end of the year. This is a huge contrast to what we saw during the global financial crisis, where it took eight, 10 years to close those output gaps. So this is what the market is concerned about, that you know, the Fed learned the lessons and central banks have learned the lessons that they want to keep the accommodation in place. They're not withdrawing the fiscal stimulus, but inflation is going up, which is by design. But there's the fears that will this be transitory or more permanent? And we are going to see that interest rates are going to have to move higher here. We're looking at the 10 year yields to probably go to, you know, close to 2 percent, even a possibility of overshooting um, by the end of the year, just given the growth numbers um, that that we're forecasting. But I think the Fed's message and the communication message has been very clear that um, they uh, very much are going to be patient. They're going to wait. They see the inflation as um, transitory. They don't see that inflation expectations have really moved here that much. And I think you're in for some of the strongest growth numbers that we've really seen since the 1980s as we look at the next few quarters ahead. Right. So it looks like there is still uh, some time to go before tapering, but we do need to uh, closely monitor the movements in, in uh, inflation. Uh, so Leah, on a somewhat related question, what do you think then are the interest rate implications on banks and deposits in the near term? Yeah. So as, first of all, thank you. Thank you for having me on this panel. Um, I think on balance, interest rate increases are positive uh, for banks, you know, as we can now have the opportunity to begin to reverse the margin compression experience in 2020, right? For example, building back in spread through beta management. Um, equally important, however, is also the pace and size of quantitative tightening, right? i.e. removing liquidity from the system, which typically happens in parallel. So that excess market liquidity, which really resulted from the massive quantitative easing is a challenge for all banks, right, post Basel III, where on the GSIP um, leverage ratio and the various regulations. So I think certainly, you know, hearing Joy talking about uh, increasing interest rate um, is, you know, definitely have, will have a positive impact on banks. Right, so that's, we, we're also, I think, for banks in general on a positive trajectory as well. Um, so coming back to the broader economy, Joyce, you talked a little bit about sort of the interest rate policy implications. Um, can we then maybe dive into sort of how the U.S. is doing and what are some of the other latest policy implications on the overall market and the economy? Well, I think that, Lou, one thing that's very important to point out compared to other crises is that you know the balance sheet is in a fundamentally different place. We have consumer debt at a 40-year low. We have savings um, that are very high. If you look at excess savings and income, it's maybe... T- 10 to 15% higher. So a lot of the questions that we are getting are about asset bubbles, about global financial stability. But I would point out that compared to the global financial crisis, when we saw a period of deleveraging, um, you know, we're in a period now where the balance sheets um, are very healthy. Um, we are also in a very different situation with respect to the unemployment numbers. At this time, after the global financial crisis, you had unemployment numbers that were nine and a half percent. We're at about 6% right now. And even though there have been some um, concerns about labor shortages, we do see the unemployment number continuing to come down to four and a half percent. So you know, we are at a recovery now that um, you know a year ago, we all talked about what this recovery would look like. Would it be um, V-shaped? Would it be a U? And it sort of does look like a U. We had one of the fastest downturns ever that we have seen, really at an unprecedented pace. And we also, then we had a, you know, a, a U and then we had one of the fastest upturns. But I also think that one thing that's very different um, about where we're at right now is that this is not 
a synchronized recovery, which is one reason why the financial markets have not um, you know, uh, been as concerned about there being an asset bubble. First, you had China first in and first out. Then you had the United States. We went from China exceptionalism to U.S. exceptionalism. And then in the third quarter of the year, we actually have Europe recovering on a quarterly basis after all of the lockdowns, the second wave, as the vaccinations are rolled out by about 15 percent. So the fact that it has not been synchronized has actually um, meant that some of the concerns about an asset bubble are not as pronounced as they have been when everything's been synchronized and you could have had much more um, you know, of, of, a, of, of a collective view that um, things were overheating. We've had this actually staggered. And that's been one of the silver linings when we look at the financial market. So we do continue to think that you know, the S&P 500 is going to do well here. And one of it is the corporate balance sheet. The corporate balance sheet is really very healthy. Um, the S&P 500 companies now have over $2 trillion in cash a year ago, this was only $540 billion. So the household balance sheet is in a good place. The um, corporate balance sheet is in a good place because you had record issuance that occurred last year off of low interest rates. So we're actually quite comfortable with the S&P 500 target at 4,400. We still think that there is further to run. It's going to be in cyclicals and in these recovery plays. Um, we also think that the energy sector commodities look very attractive here, particularly as the ongoing concerns about inflation are not going to go away. But we think this is also a recovery that will rotate. We do look to Europe to catch up in the second half of the year, and that should come out in the third quarter numbers. So it's uh, definitely great to be in a position with, you know, many aspects of the economy in an upward trajectory, especially uh, compared to the uncertainty we all faced um, around the same time last year, actually. So Leah, speaking of the growth boom here, we have also seen uh, significantly accelerated digitalization in many aspects of the U.S. and global economy, as well as our um, everyday life uh, this past year. How do you think companies have changed or um, adapted to different business and operational models during COVID? And what do you think are the longer term implications of uh, this kind of transformation? Yeah, you know, great, great question. I, I think, as you said, right, we really see a tremendous acceleration uh, in digitization. Right? Digitization was happening before COVID and it just really greatly um, accelerated. And there are external factors, right? If you look at the slide um, shown on the screen, really there are two main factors, right? One is around the advancement of technology. For example, Internet of Things, really we, we've seen explosive growth right, on the IoT devices. And it's projected that we'll have 30 plus billion of those devices. You think about your smartphones, right? Your, your connected cars and refrigerators and whatnot. 30 billion is a huge number. That's only you know, four years away. Um, and actually interestingly, last year was the first year that IoT, the number of IoT devices exceeded, like surpassed the non-IoT devices, right? And you think that that's the implication of how consumer, you know, every, how we live our everyday lives. And you know, what we prefer, how do we interact with each other with merchants uh, digitally? And second external force you know, is really the changing workforce. Millennials will be about 75% of the workforce by 2030. And many of them are decision makers. So as we think about how they grew up in kind of more digital native way and how they would want that digital experience, not only in their personal lives, but also in the work environment. But that has profound implications on you know, how companies are run and how we as banks supporting those companies. And digital adoption definitely see a huge acceleration. Uh, if you look at the next page, right, we, we see also variance that diff to, at different paces, um, depending on which region you're in. Right, in North America is projected that, you know, COVID really accelerated the digital adoption by six years versus in Asia, I think the projection is by 10 plus years. And that's because Asia is already very advanced, right, in digital adoption. Think of you know, the, you know, China, India, the Southeast a Asian countries, right, digitization is already very high. So it's further acceleration. And versus in you know, other countries, you know, regions like Europe is more varied, right? It's countries like UK, Spain, we see very high digitization um, adoption versus others. Um, but overall, I think the entire world is moving towards more of that digital experience, right? That kind of invisible um, payment experience. So if you go to the next slide, you know, what's the implication of that on, on corporations? 
And we actually see tremendous change and, and transformation across almost all industry verticals. Right, not, you know, you can see the slide. I'm not going to go through every single vertical, but you know, for example, e-commerce. Right, last 18 months, um, explosive growth. Uh, the big names you can think of: Amazon, Alibaba, uh, right around the world is really kind of tremendous growth um, on the on the e-commerce front. You pick another vertical like consumer retail, right, on the lower right hand side. Um, a lot of the consumer retail companies are now looking at setting up new business models, right? They, they are traditionally brick and mortar and now they're thinking about offline to online or a hybrid model, right? Direct consumer type of digital engagement. And if you look at the car industry, connected cars is certainly, um, you know, as a company, we have a lot of uh, clients and a lot of uh, discussions uh, on that front, right? How do we really enable that car as, as almost like experience, as a marketplace, as a payment device? Um, right, you know, to, to create the, those new business models for our clients. So I think in short, if you look at the next slide, the impact on the business models, we see a fast growth, emergence and growth of these like newer types of business models across all the industries. Um, as you can see on the screen, right, recurring revenue type of model, that's think of it as subscription driven model, right? A lot of the companies are adopting that, that type of uh, revenue model. Ecosystem play, we see all the big, super apps, right, in the marketplaces, all the fintechs there, really everyone is trying to get to that ecosystem where it's very sticky, sticky right? Consumers, sellers, merchants, they're, they're all within that ecosystem for growth. Pay as you go, all right? A lot of the kind of, you know, utility companies are exploring that, insurance company, auto company, just more of a personalized, customized um, business model, right, service model. Contextual commerce, think of Alexa right, voice commerce, um, all modes of um, interaction and commerce enablement. And of course, shared economy. I'm sure every one of us have, you know, used Uber and other, right, all the kind of shared economy type of business models. So we see all these pivots are very essential for a large number of companies as they think about how to, you know, emerge stronger from this crisis and also leverage opportunities that really got accelerated um, from this crisis. Well, I mean, the digital transformation is uh, definitely fascinating and uh, very dynamic, but um, also very complex and rapidly changing, right? So perhaps um, a follow-up question for you, Leah, would be how important is innovation in all of this? Maybe using uh, JP Morgan Chase as an example, as the largest U.S. headquartered global bank, how has our focus on innovation in a number of key areas, including uh, in payments? impacted uh, what we can deliver for our clients and, and for the industry as a whole? Yeah, no, great question. I think innovation is more critical than ever. I mean, just based on all the factors we discussed, right? The consumer behavior changes, the preferences and how the business models are shifting. So I think, you know, we have a good starting point. JP Morgan, right, is a global leader in the payment space. We have the scale and the reach, right? And really deep expertise in the payments area. Um, but we can never be complacent, especially given how dynamic the payments landscape is, is evolving. We need to be in tune with our client needs and our corporate client, right, how they change their business models. So on the innovation front, we are very aggressively investing in new payments platforms, value-added services. You know, I heard Jamie, um, you know, very passionately talking about payments and we want to, you know, we will take do whatever, you know, invest whatever it takes to, to lead in the space. Um, so I think if you think about our, our philosophy, our principles, right, in terms of innovation, one is we believe in co-innovating with our clients because we want to, you know, really understand, deeply understand client needs and really create that future-proof type of solution so that we can support our clients' growth. Like we may not know all the answers, but we're investing, we're willing to understand our clients and we are willing to co-invest and co-innovate with our clients. And second principle is really about being very open. We're building an open ecosystem when it comes to innovation, right? I think that's a big change for, for a big bank like JP Morgan. We used to really prefer to build everything in-house so that we know, right? We, you know, this is, you know, security, cybersecurity and everything is watertight and is first class. I think we now have, you know, shifting the mindset of saying, hey, we wanna bring the best solutions to our clients. And those solutions could come from our in-house build, right? For our core competencies, it could come from great like, niche solutions uh, offered by the fintechs so that we can integrate those solutions and bring the best of both worlds to our clients. And you know, as you can see, we, we put like two examples there, Zora really a fintech powering subscription type of models we completely are fully integrated with 
with Zora to support our clients. Right, FitBank is another example, which is a fintech in, in LATAM, and they have great local solutions. Right, I think that's a you know, much faster way to go to market and roll out local services for our, for our corporate clients and global corporations. The last pillar is really disruptive. Because um, we think about it, right, we, we have a dominant position today, but you know, a lot of disruptions are happening and fintechs are you know, reaching scale. Um, you know, we want to be future ready. We want to build that next generation of payments platform which may even cannibalize our existing revenue streams. Right? Think about cross-border payments, um, the Onyx platform, our Link, right? which is a you know, number one bank-led blockchain platform. Um, their purpose is to facilitate that future right, you know, cross-border border real-time payments uh, movement. That could cannibalize our wire revenue, for example, but you know, rather than we would wanna do it to ourselves rather than let somebody else do it to us. So I think that's our overall kind of very aggressive, very, um, forward-looking uh, mindset when it comes to investing and in, in innovation. Very, uh, very impressive. Even though we live and breathe this every day, but every time I hear about all these initiatives, it, you know, still very impressed by what, you know, we as an institution uh, have been doing. And this reminds me of something uh, Steve Jobs once said that uh, innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower. And it is a very true statement here. Um, so coming back to you, Joyce, we've talked quite a bit about the U.S. and developed markets, but are you seeing further disparity uh, between emerging markets and developed markets as a result uh, of COVID uh, or the reverse where gaps are actually narrowing uh, in some instances? And what about China? In your latest research report, you highlighted that China's financial market reform is on track despite COVID, uh, which is very encouraging, right? No, thanks so much, Lou, for that question. And April, maybe I can turn to the slide on China, which is the third slide, I believe, um, you know, that shows uh, China's growth. But um, first of all, let me just say that, um, you know, we do see China reaching the size of the U.S. economy before the end of this decade. And China was the only country that had positive growth last year with 9.3% growth this year and the currency appreciation. We moved up the time frame for China matching the size of the US economy probably by about three to five years. So um, we do think that uh, you know, it's not just that China's economy will match the size of the US, China also has the second largest bond and equity markets. Um, and that's one of the big stories really that lies ahead, um, just greater foreign participation that we see going ahead in those markets. So I think that you know when COVID-19 broke out in early 2020, very few people would have predicted that China would receive record portfolio inflows. But we saw record inflows last year in the order of 575 um, billion dollars. Some of this was China going into the mainstream indexes. JP Morgan finished that process at the end of last year. Um, Bloomberg Barclays finished that process as well. And FTSE will start that process in October, in the fourth quarter of the year. But last year, we saw a record $160 billion go into um, China's onshore bond markets, which have a market cap of $17 trillion. And when you look at foreign ownership in that marketplace, it's still at a very low level. It's still at around just 3%. Taking a look at the equity market, China also has the second largest equity market um, at over $12 trillion. And foreign ownership there is only 4.3% um, of ownership. So one thing I would just say is that even though we have seen that, um, you know, um, you know, that there are still lingering tensions between the U.S. and China. The financial market opening has continued. It's also a major part of the phase one trade agreement, which remains in place as the foundation for a lot of the bilateral discussions between the U.S. and China. And the phase one agreement really did call for removing many of the foreign ownership restrictions, expanding the business opportunities for foreign financial institutions, and also um, 
reforms that allow foreign investors to more easily access the onshore market. And that's remained in place. The index inclusion has really given um, investors an efficient way to invest in China. Um, now, I don't see the trade tariffs being um, erased that quickly. I think that those um, you know, tariffs will remain in place. But I do think the financial market opening is something um, that does stand out. And you can just see from the chart the number of institutions that have um, you know, continued to deepen their involvement with China. Um, the other thing I would just point out is that trade between the US and China is you know, approaching $600 billion. And although there are some areas where the you know, tariffs remain in place, um, the, the areas that are, um, you know, that, that, that for much of the bilateral trade, um, you know, that it has remained um, very strong. And when we look at the business surveys, um, you know, the um, Chamber of Commerce, the uh, um, in the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai did a very um, interesting survey. It shows that um, 60 percent, more than 60 percent of U.S. businesses are more op optimistic about operating in China um, since the Biden administration um, took office. So I do think that, um, you know, even though we've had the uncertainty with the pandemic, um, we've seen this commitment to opening the financial markets and we've seen businesses continue to look at deepening their involvement in China. So that's China, but then let's just talk about the rest of emerging markets, um, which you asked about. And we are seeing here just a real divergence between emerging markets ex-China and develop market growth. Um, we're actually going to see one of the largest growth differentials um, that we've had, e even more so than the Asia financial crisis in the late 1990s. And this is partly because you have slow vaccination rates, you have much more limited um, fiscal space. Um, you know, the amount of fiscal stimulus that the developed countries did was extraordinary. I mean, the US, we're looking at $7 trillion, 30% of GDP. Emerging markets countries just can't do that. That. So we are still looking at emerging markets being, you know, probably about 4% below the pre-crisis path that they had been on when you take out China. And if we take out the Northern Asian countries and Mexico, some of the manufacturing countries, it's one of the biggest differentials um, that we've seen in a very long time. You know, I talked about the quarterly numbers being, you know, 10%, 15%, 8% numbers, you know, in the next couple of quarters. I mean, we see a differential between emerging markets and developed markets that, you know, is as great as, um, 5%. Um, you know, given um, just the eye-popping numbers that we see coming out of the developed countries. And I think that, you know, this will stabilize by the fourth quarter of the year. But what we do see is that for emerging markets, you know, ex-China, you're going to be well below what we look at as the long-term average that, you know, historically we have seen before um, between emerging markets and um, developed markets. And um, we are seeing that much of this is related to the pandemic still, that in some of the large emerging markets countries, you know, India stands out, um, Brazil stands out, you know, it has been very hard to get this, um, you know, under control. So the um, emerging markets remain a space where you know, we still see a lot of opportunities, but we also do see more challenges ahead with um, just the, you know, the, um, the pandemic and, and, and the way that this will actually delay the recovery in emerging markets going ahead. Right. So it's, it's interesting to see when we talk about emerging markets, we also talk about, you know, emerging markets ex-China, right? It's very interesting there. Um, the financial markets opening in China is definitely exciting and uh, to a certain extent might give insight to other onshore opportunities for multinational companies. So on a relevant topic, Aliyah, can you share a little bit about how we are supporting multinational companies, including U.S. headquarter clients currently doing business in China, particularly from a uh, wholesale payments perspective? And what are some of your key observations on their business transformation uh, internationally? Yeah, no, th thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely. As Joy said, right, China continues to be such an important market for, for many uh, American companies, just given the sheer size and, and the purchasing power. Um, so, you know, JP Morgan, we're definitely committed to investing and growing in China, um, in, in our China franchise for the long term. We've already been in the country in China for 100 years, right? We're planning, thinking about our strategy, our resourcing for the next 100 years. Um, so we, you know, we already have a pretty strong local um, presence. We have locally incorporated bank onshore. We recently obtained the full banking license, right, to operate 
across a wide range of businesses in China. So that's all very exciting. Um, kind of from the wholesale payments perspective, we, we really see the optimism, or I think Joyce mentioned, right, of, of American companies doing business in China, growing in China. Um, especially you think about this segment like consumer retail, right? The familiar brands you, you can think of Nike or Starbucks or whatnot, growing um, very, right, very uh, positively. And across other segments as well, right? Technology, right? You know, diversified industry clients, healthcare, medical devices. So we support a wide range of um, clients, you know, global clients uh, and, and their ambition and their growth uh, in China. And where are we focused on? So we're focused on two things to support these companies. One is really share our knowledge and, and understanding and expertise in, in the local market, right? China is a very a pretty complicated market with local regulations, macro trends, right? We, but you know, the advantage of being a global bank is we see, we see a lot of clients and we see a lot of clients from different regions and including China, headquarter clients and you know, headquarter clients in other regions. So we share a lot of the best practices. Uh, with, with, with our clients, right? Our understanding of the local market uh, and the trends. And second is, you know, we have the capability to support their cross-border needs. That's really the, the I would say the focus of, of our business is to support their global, right? Their global franchise and especially cross-border payments, right? We think about liquidity management for those companies, right? See, you know, Chinese brands that restricted currencies. How do you think about managing that liquidity, managing, you know, onshore, offshore? How do you mobilize? The liquidity, right? The cash buffer uh, in China, across China, across the globe. So I think we look at these clients and we support them on a global basis uh, for their working capital, for the FX management, liquidity management, and China is a very, very critical component of that of that global structure. Actually, by the same by the same token, I was wondering, Lou, um, given your role, right, supporting uh, a lot of the Chinese companies doing business in the U.S., um, do you see like similar trends and similar needs? Yeah, no, thanks, Leah. Um, you know, just like you mentioned, right, China is a very critical market for a lot of the sort of the non-Chinese companies, but U.S. is also a very critical market for a lot of the foreign multinationals, including uh, Chinese companies that are doing business in this region. So there are definitely uh, similarities and differences for our Chinese multinational clients doing business in the U.S. Uh, many of these companies are already um, at the very forefront of the transformation that we talked about earlier, right? And some are looking at ways to more effectively adapt to different customer behaviors and changing market practices that are also unique uh, to the U.S. market. And I think many are already fully aware of or or at least in the process of realizing the significance of being truly flexible and nimble in managing overseas operations and business strategy. And they're also uh, cautiously optimistic with regards to commercial aspirations as well. Um, and based on obser uh, our observations, um, what is really essential through um, all of these is the importance of having the right partner. And you know, um, having the right local business partner, having the right banking service provider, and so on, are instrumental in a company's journey for operational excellence and for commercial success, especially uh, outside of its home market, which is the case for many of the Chinese multinational companies um, operating here. Um, and, and with that, why don't we uh, then switch gears a little bit and move to another very important topic, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, May is Asian and Pacific Islanders Heritage Month, and a lot has happened to the API community this past year, and especially in the last several months. Both of you are um, highly successful Asian American women in very senior positions at a leading global institution like JP Morgan Chase. Do you feel a, a sense of increased responsibility both to the community you're from and to the company you work for to have a voice and to speak up for change? Uh, Leah, why don't we uh, go with you first? Uh, yeah, sure, sure, absolutely, absolutely. I think I feel you know very much increased you know obligation. I think it's twofold, right? Re one is I feel like there's obligation for all of us to raise awareness and understanding of the the AAPI community, right? I think is that's the, just the fundamental first step. There. There is a lot of myth and, and like preconception, uh, right, um, about the AAPI community that I think simply are just not accurate, right? You know, we we are a very diverse um, population, right, representing over thirty countries, 
So it's not just India, China, right? The, the big ones we, we are familiar with, it's really a diverse population. And it's also the fastest growing population uh, in the US, right? Currently we represent a slightly over 6% of the population. And, and more importantly, it's a very like economically diverse and divided population. Um, so I think the perception that, you know, a Asian people that work hard, all middle class, that, that's just wrong, right? That's just not accurate. A lot of the um, people, you know, Asian uh, heritage people that, in this country live near or below poverty, right? It is our, I think we just need to do a lot more in raising that awareness, educating people on the long legacy of the AAPI community, right? And the historical exclusion and inequality that, that experienced about, by our community. I think, you know, that, that is really the first step. And then, and this next is really just take a stand, right? Take a stand, um, stand together, speak up to have our voice voice is heard is just really critical, more critical than ever. If I think about, look at the numbers, right? I think that anti-Asian hate crime increased by nearly 150% in 2020, while the overall crime dropped to like 7%. That's just really, really concerning. And that calls to, calls to action, like calls to all of us to stand in solidarity and, and stand up against Asian crime and really have, have our voices heard. Thank you, Leah, for sharing those uh, very important perspectives. Um, how about you, Joyce? No, thank you so much, Lou. And I have to say that it's just been a pleasure to work with Leah and Lou with you on so many of these initiatives um, and to be with the China General Chamber of Commerce this month to talk about these issues. You know, so I've worked in um, financial markets for more than 30 years, but this is the first moment in my career that I can really recall a pan-Asian moment um, where everybody really is organizing together. And, you know, I've seen six different financial crises, but this is a crisis that we can not let go to waste. And I think very much to Leah's points, there is um, self-awareness um, and education. Um, and also that this is, you know, a, a community that has grown very rapidly just in recent years, you know, post-1965 immigration. So I think, you know, Asian American identity is still being created. Um, you know, it is, uh, you know, really what a lot of people ask me about Asian American identity, it's going to be defined by what happens in the future. There's a couple of important things that JP Morgan um, has been working on. First of all, there's just coming out with a very strong statement against racism. There is also, you know, partnering and working with allies. But as a research analyst, there's also a real focus on tracking the data. Um, and um, making sure that um, we have the facts which will inform policy. So a lot of the groups that have been created um, at the start of the pandemic, like Stop AAPI Hate, um, you know, they came about just you know, a, a little bit over a year ago. And you really need those data points to um, inform and set policy. Um, it's very central to the debates on how, group, um, you know, how groups are organized and, and classified by the governments, by colleges, and and universities, so they're not lumped together as one monolithic group, um, as Leah pointed out. So I think that you know there's also um, a lot of different seminars that we've worked on about how you need to self-advocate for yourself and your community, how you need to partner um, with others. So what JP Morgan has done is actually identify um, a number of um, you know, in, in, uh, organizations, nonprofits that work in the community um, that we are working in partnership with with um, you know, groups like um, Asian Americans for Advancing Justice, the Asian American Federation, um, you know, Stop AAPI Hate, um, and actually focused on the education, the history of Asians in America, um, the model minority myth, how it came about and how this has been something that's been very divisive um, and ways in which we will actually use this moment of awareness to build better institutional um, frameworks, um, you know, databases, and, and ways in which we're addressing some of the challenges that have come out. You yeah, and totally, totally agree with some of the points you raised. And just to follow up on that, Joyce, you are the executive sponsor for our women's and um, API business resource groups at JP Morgan. And there has been a tremendous amount of discussions, as you mentioned, on a number of key issues impacting the API community, right, including anti-Asian hate, stereotypes, and the glass ceiling, just to highlight a few. Uh, and to your earlier point, our, our firm as an institution continues to be very focused on our DI efforts. So what are some of the lessons learned through these? And I think you highlighted some of that, but you know, what are some of the areas of opportunities that you see and any advice 
uh, for those in the audience and you know, for those in the broader community. Well, you know, I, I think that, you know, for, for Asian Americans compared to some of the other groups, um, you know, the problem isn't representation. We start out at a junior level with very high level of representation. Um, it's not the supply issue. It's how we get people to more senior leadership positions. And we've seen a couple of things at JP Morgan. We've seen that the point where um, a lot of people struggle of, or a lot of women struggle is, you know, sort of at the vice president point, you know, there's a very, um, you know, um, prescribed steps when you're an associate and when you're an analyst and you're working for a senior person. But when you become a vice president and need to develop your own presence and brand um, and uh, your own following, that's when it becomes much more tricky. So we have run a lot of sessions um, for women and for Asian women where we really talk to them about developing a brand and a presence. And, you know, some of the lessons learned, I tell a lot of the women, look, you're, you're going to have to speak up, you know, twice. So people don't think that the first time is a fluke, that it's not always going to be comfortable. And sometimes I've told them that, look, it's not just um, your own judgment. I've talked to Asian women who say, I'm speaking so loudly. I said, yeah, but you know, I'm listening and I can't hear you. So um, there's also that you need the judgment of others. So we've really spent a lot of time thinking about this, um, you know, at JP Morgan and also, you know, with both of you, Leah and, and Lou, you know, working with other women on these issues. Um, you know, so that they do uh, think about the ways in which they have to take risks, develop their presence, um, you know, also just get a branding that's beyond the technical capabilities to really looking at the leadership skills um, and, um, and sometimes just moving out of your comfort zone. Um, so I think that, you know, these are, you know, things I have seen throughout um, my career that, um, you know, I think there's more discussion about it right now. So I'm, you know, actually really quite optimistic that just the level of confidence conversation that we're having right now. Um, some of the programs that are being put into place and some of the focus in partnering with other groups has put us in a place that is really a different point than I've seen at other moments where this will come up, but um, there isn't necessarily a, a, a framework or a way in which it's being institutionalized. So I think this is a crisis that, you know, is not going to go to waste um, for a lot of different groups that work on um, Asian American, you know, issues and representation. Well, thank you. Thank you both for sharing your vulnerability, personal experiences, and views. And I think we do have a long way to go, but it is important for us to support each other as partners and as allies in this journey. Uh, now, this wraps up our sort of panel discussion, and we will open up for questions. Um, I already see a lot of questions coming in uh, during the hour, so I will try to consolidate them um, for our panelists. And I think the, you know, there are several questions asked about Biden's infrastructure plan and sort of the impact on markets and the economy. Uh, Joyce, would you like to maybe um, highlight further on that piece? So I'm sorry, can you just repeat the question a little? Infrastructure, so Biden's infrastructure plan, um, what's the impact on the markets and the you know, stock market, overall market and economy? Okay, so so um, you know our assumptions are that you're going to have to see some compromises with this infrastructure plan. That you're probably going to come to a number that's closer to one trillion dollars, uh, you know, not the two to three trillion dollars that we've been talking about. And some of these social infrastructure programs, you know, may not come to fruition. And there are some key dates that we're watching here. So to get through budget reconciliation, so that you can get this through the Senate with 50 votes, a lot of this needs to come you know into place over the next couple of weeks where you come up with, um, you know, really just the, the, the numbers that are going to be set um, to be voted on. And um, I do think it's probably going to be a Democrat only bill that passes. I think the key dates to watch on this will be sometime in September, because a lot of things come to a head in September. You have the expiration of unemployment benefits, um, student loan deferrals, um, you know, you've got the debt ceiling in late July, and over the summer, you've got the government funding, and you also also have the FAST, which is the um, you know fixing America surface transportation bill as well. So I think the bill is going to be whittled down. I do think you're going to get something through. I think it's more likely to come through in September. I'm not so sure you're going to get some of the social infrastructure you know package through, which deals more with you know child care and health care and some of these um, other issues. But I mean, I think you have to really look at what the Biden administration has done, and it's been just remarkable the amount of stimulus 
stimulus that has been put um, into the system. I mean, we are looking at something that over a two year period is around 30% of GDP and you know, unprecedented is not being overused here. Um, the last time you can think about that kind of spending that was done was you know, really World War II when you were funding a war. So you, we do have a boom that's coming up. Um, we have debt levels that have risen you know, as a result of this. We have um, fiscal deficit, that uh, budget deficit this year, that's $3.8 trillion that you're going to need to issue $3 trillion in treasuries for. Um, but I do think you will see um, infrastructure coming through, but not at the full size of the package. I think it is likely to be, as the other proposals, one party that decides on it, and that it is um, you know, more of a September um, event um, that coincides with many of these deadlines that are coming up. Thank you, Joyce. Um, so there are a few questions about uh, the digital currency and then JP Morgan coin and sort of how, you know, what's going on with the Bitcoin and sort of what we're doing from a blockchain perspective. So uh, Leah, would you like to cover some of those questions? Yeah, sure, happy to. Um, I know there's a tremendous interest, right, in the whole cryptocurrency, it's just hyper volatile um, in the recent months. I would first say JP Morgan coin is not a cryptocurrency. Right. Rather, it is a permission system that serves as a payment rail and deposit account ledger. In that sense, it's not dissimilar to kind of the, you know, the DD, the deposit demand, um, demand deposit accounts that we, we hold, we hold a, as a bank, right? So JP Morgan coin system is designed to facilitate that programmable real-time multi-currency payments using blockchain and a smart contract technology. It really allows you know, participating JP Morgan clients to transfer US dollars held on deposit with JP Morgan to each other, facilitating that movement, um, right, real-time movement um, across borders. So I think you know, being uh, on the permission system uh, has tremendous advantages, especially for our corporate clients, right? Because you know, it, it has, it's a permission base, it allows JP Morgan coin product to maintain that privacy uh, in the system as well as being uh, you know, high, with a high transaction speed. So if by comparison, if you think of Bitcoin, Bitcoin on the other hand is a cryptocurrency, it's on a public system, right? Generally a public network um, of transactions, right? They're not private, although they're anonymous, but they're not private. Um, and also the transaction speed is also lower given that the consensus protocols are just very energy consuming. So I think there are a lot of differences, um, uh, fundamental differences between JP1 coin um, and versus a Bitcoin, right, cryptocurrency. And when it comes to, right, what do we think about our JP Morgan coin and our blockchain um, system? We really view those as our next generation payments infrastructure that we talked to, you know, a little bit about earlier. Um, we look at real use cases for our corporate clients. It could be B2B, right, uh, or B2C type of applications and to facilitate either um, information exchange, right? Because it's a package of information. You think about sanction screening, you know, payments got stopped. We can use this technology, this coin um, to really resolve those issues very quickly. Or it could be real money movement um, together with the information package, right? And we are um, testing uh, and supporting, piloting a lot of the initiatives with our corporate clients and with some you know, central banks and, and government agencies as well. Thank you, Leah. It's also always good to clarify that JP Morgan coin is not a cryptocurrency. I think we get a lot of questions on that all the time. So um, that was a good question. Um, so going back to you, Joyce, I think there are a few questions about uh, supply chain, right? So what do you, you know, how long do you think sort of some of the supply chain issues faced by, you know, especially the auto sector will continue and when will the situation show meaningful improvements? I think this is going to continue at least for the next three to five months because you have all of this pent up demand for travel um, and you also have a clear preference for taking private vehicles as well. So you, know, you will have some of these supply chain um, concerns alleviated as you see more production come online and capacity come online and you see other parts of the world like Europe also coming out of the pandemic, but the demand's going to remain high. And um, you know, you, we, we will see an inflation you know, go to 3%. And I think, you know, the markets are going to stay very focused on this issue, how much of this is transitory before uh, we actually can address some of the inventory issues and some of the labor supply issues. I mean, look at the numbers that have come out of the US and China, 
0.4% um, you know, in, in inflation because the services sector is picking up here as well. So I think this is going to be with us for um, you know, the duration you know, of the year. Um, as we see all of these COVID recovery plays coming into place, and we also see the summer months where you know, more travel will pick up as well. Um, you know, and we do think that you're also going to continue to see you know, commodity prices um, here, oil prices you know, move higher. We're looking at rent oil you know, going to you know, $74 um, you know, by the end of the year, because a lot of the demand numbers that we were looking at for oil, you know, we've had to move that up as we've seen um, the, the reopening, the vaccinations accelerate. So the, these inflationary pressures are going to remain top of mind, I think, with investors. Um, you know, and I do think the Fed will send a very consistent message that we are going to be patient here. Um, we think this is more transitory, just as we can't sustain 10%, 8% growth rates. Some of this will you know, pass as well. But those questions are going to linger um, as we you know, approach year end and also look at the outlook for 2022. Thank you, Joyce. Um, so the next question uh, is for, for you, Leah. I think we talked a lot about innovation and sort of what we're doing for our clients and you know, in their transformation and digitalization. Um, so what, what, can you share sort of what, what's the sort of view on fintech or, or tech fin, you know, companies? And as a leading international bank, uh, how, do you, you know, how do we partner and compete with them at the same time, but you know, also making sure that we are serving them appropriately to meet their requirements and their needs as well? Yeah, you know, great question. Um, so fintechs certainly have grown tremendously, right? And then, you know, you, we saw all these companies, Stripe, Square, and Stripe, you know, close to 100 billion valuation. I mean, I think they, they, have, they have really strength in, in terms of that understanding the customer experience and right? what the clients, consumers, sellers, merchants, what are, what are they looking for in that experience? So I think there's certainly... Um, I think they are our competitors for sure, but they're also our friends and they're, they're our clients. So I think we no longer live in the black and white world of you know, friends or enemy. I think it's more like a friend of me type of um, ecosystem reality, right? And I think that is very, very interesting. I think our mindset towards FinTech is we really want to just bring the best to our clients so we can partner for the right partners. We'll partner with FinTechs so they'll bring the best of both worlds to, to our corporate clients. Many of the large fintechs are our clients, right? Um, you think about uh, PayPal, which is in the public domain, right? We, we help them um, implement the real-time payments uh, capability, right? For the PayPal wallet holders and merchants and whatnot, we can really facilitate that real-time payments within 15 seconds. I mean, that's good for, for everyone. That's good for PayPal. That's good for their ex customers. That's good for us because we build that payments um, infrastructure, right? We want the scale. So I think in those situations, it's almost like a win-win situation. We absolutely will partner with the right partner, right? With the right fintechs to, to, to serve our clients, to serve um, those fintech players. And then in other areas, we will we'll compete, right? We'll compete on capabilities, on scale, and we have our advantages, just like fintechs have their advantages, right? I think we focus on our own core competencies, which you think about JP Morgan, the Fortress balance sheet, right? The global presence, the teams, the expertise we have on the ground. I mean, so, so I think it's, it's, a, um, it's a very interesting world. Uh, we, we, we partner, we compete. And for the right ones, we, we buy them, right? We, we acquire FinTechs. And you think about WePay, right? Which is a tremendous asset for us in the merchant acquiring space for our small businesses. You think about Instamet, right? Which is, you know, really advanced technology uh, player in, in digitizing the entire claims payments of, you know, revenue cycles. So I think, right, we, we are very flexible uh, in terms of buy, partner, compete. Uh, it, it is, it's an interesting world, it's a dynamic world. And then we are, we're both in a very open uh, system and open mindset when it comes to uh, working with the fintechs. Great, thank you, Leah. Um, I think we have time for one last question. So, you know, regarding US China, Joyce, can you talk a little bit about sort of where things are going with exchange rate? US dollar and RD or exchange. Yeah, I, the important thing that I would emphasize is that 
that um, you know, CNY, the exchange rate, renminbi has become much more flexible over recent years, really steadily since 2015. And what we've seen is that you know, strong fundamentals, whether it's the growth um, differentials, the interest rate differentials, the current account surplus have supported the currency appreciation, you know, really throughout the pandemic. Um, we've, as I mentioned, just seen these very strong inflows into bond markets and those inflows will continue. I mean, you still have 97% of developed market central banks with interest rates less than 1%. So the 3.5% yield in China as a structural trade will remain um, attractive. So I think that, um, you know, we see that um, the, you know, we're forecasting, you know, the um, CNY trade weighted exchange rate to be pretty stable in um, this year. Um, you're forecasting 6.5 um, at year end. But I would say that this has been a progression that we've seen over the last um, few years of allowing greater flexibility, but also strong fundamentals that have supported the exchange rate here. So I am not overly concerned um, about volatility you know, in the exchange rate. Um, I think we are getting quite a few questions about just with the US growth numbers, are we going to see you know, a much stronger dollar here? But as I mentioned, one thing we are going to see is a rotation you know, very strong growth in the U.S., then you will have strong growth in Europe coming up, and you have some sort of moderating forces here. So the exchange rate hasn't really been the top of mind um, focus. Um, it has really been on inflation and bond yields compared to some other periods where we have looked at just the macro issues that are top of mind for investors. Right. So another growth story there. So um, I think we're at time and, you know, close to the top of the hour. And uh, we have obviously covered um, a lot of ground during this past hour. So thank you, Joyce and Leah, for your informative and inspirational insight. And uh, thank you again, CGCC, for getting all of us together. I now um, hand it over to CGCC for a final announcement. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lou, Joyce, and Leah. It was such a great honor to have the three of you to take part in today's webinar. Um, just want to give one everyone's heads up, like the materials associated with today's discussion, including a full report and the full slides, because I think I did miss one or two of them, will be sent to the audience in a later email. Um, we will also have two CGCC events coming up and the RSVP information could be found in the chat box below. So for tomorrow, uh, we will be hosting a one-to-one -one dialogue with Mr. Richard Adelman, the CEO of Adelman, which is a global communication firm, a very famous world-class PR firm. And Mr. Adelman will discuss topics, including the changing rhetoric regarding the US-China business community, best practices in reputation management and case studies of the well-known companies such as TikTok in regards to crisis and brand management. And the second event is that from May 21st to 31st, CGCC Foundation will partner with Fanke US for a fun run challenge. The event invites participants to run, walk, or cycle to raise money for Achilles International, which is a global organization that, transform, that transforms the lives of people with disabilities through athletic programs and social connections. And we welcome you and your colleagues to join us at both of the coming events. And last, uh, we would like to thank JP Morgan, Joyce, Leah, Lou, and all of you again, who like helped make this great uh, discussion happen today. And we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.